Thank you. This is Carl Wise, Thompson Industrial Service, uh, Senior Business Development Manager with a company. I've been with them 22 years, and I'm based out of North Carolina. And uh, what I'll be doing a live part of it today is uh, initially I'll be just give you a very brief overview of who Thompson is, uh, and then just what we do, and then uh, and our involvement with the EPIC process. Uh, you know, our involvement uh, is the, the application and the utilization of the technology in conjunction with our own uh, automated uh, capabilities and our field service personnel to go on out to ac actually execute the work. Uh, but uh, the, like I say, the first few slides are just going to be a real quick overview of who Thompson is. So, you know, who that, that piece of the, uh, the service would come from. Uh, you know, they are, our specialty is strictly cleaning. That's all we do. We've been doing it for 35 years. And, uh, you know, we basically uh, kind of the cradle of the grave, if you will, for, uh, for cleaning services from inceptions, from everything from uh, vacuum excavation for uh, greenfield work to, uh, to uh, unfortunately, when something has to be decommissioned and so on. But, uh, headquartered in Sumter, South Carolina, uh, you know, just like I'm sure everybody on this call is that uh, the safety is number one in our priority and our design of our our jobs and the scope of each and every individual job. And the way that we focus on that is through uh, severity uh, and and frequency uh, prevention. So uh, you know we implement as layer, many layers as possible, and uh, that's what this is depicting. Is just you know, the first thing we try to do is to to eliminate it, obviously, and then uh, to get to the uh, to the, the last phase of that protection is uh, is the PPE. But we try to engineer everything into the job, so uh, the PPE is just uh, for the last uh, portion of the of the safety process. Um, last is that uh, you know the covering of our our safety. Uh, statistics, uh, if you're familiar with this in, in our industrial cleaning industry, they, uh, those numbers are, are very admirable. Uh, and uh, oftentimes the uh, folks in our business are somewhere in that EMR range of about 2.0. Uh, I'm not certainly saying that everybody is, but uh, we work very hard about that serious injury and fatality prevention. It's made a tremendous difference. And the rest of that just gives a little bit of the assets that, that we have on a thousand personnel and uh, about 91 pieces of automated equipment, and 100 some vacuum trucks and so on, hydro blasters and so on. And uh, this next one, I think, will be the last slide. Uh, I believe this is just a, a great big overview of what we do, kind of a, a line sheet, if you will, uh, from chemical cleaning and fin foam of uh, air cooled heat exchangers which is in, of course, uh, many of the combined cycle plants and uh, hydro blast and vacuuming and so on. But, uh, you know, our claim to fame in many respects are our specialty services. And the one that we're going to dwell on today is the uh, EPIC for the offline diversity cleaning. And uh, for this, I'm going to turn it over to Vince, let him introduce himself, and uh, he'll give the, uh, the bulk of the presentation. I'll interject here and there, but uh, we always Welcome comments and your chats, uh, questions, uh, as, as Scott has indicated. So, Vince, take it away, please. All right, thanks. Uh, again, my name is Vince Barreto. Uh, I'm the uh, owner of Power Plus Cleaning Systems. My background is uh, from 1992 on. I was a product manager at uh, uh, for acoustic cleaning systems and some fine filtration, you know, things like uh, PTFE membrane and and pleated elements and such. Uh, ultimately, uh, the company that I was with was uh, acquired by GE in 2000, uh, remained a product manager there uh, doing the same thing. Uh, up until around 2002 and three, when I realized that uh, uh, a lot of the uh, applications on boilers that we were used, trying to use acoustic corns for, they just lacked the amount of energy and power needed to clean a lot of those larger cross sections and the ten more tenacious deposits. Uh, the sonic corns just fell short and uh, I had uh, uh, observed that on the aviation side of GE, they were doing a lot of work for 
uh, pulse detonation engines for thrust and their bench testing uh, that I was made aware of. They were using uh, these two inch tubes to create a series of detonations to provide that thrust. And I'm looking at the two inch tube and the back end of an acoustic cleaner. And uh, I basically had the idea to, to retrofit the acoustic horn with the, the, the detonation tube and create shock waves instead of sound waves. For that, I got my name on the original patent and a thousand and a, and a dollars in a plaque. Uh, don't have the plaque or the thousand dollars anymore, but uh, ended up with the technology. Which, when GE sold our division to another company, ultimately it was ended up being Parker Hannafin. But uh, during that transition, uh, I purchased the technology away from the new owners. Uh, their focus was more on the back end, the air pollution control side, and uh, I acquired it in 2014. Continued to develop it and apply it. Uh, and that's kind of the background of the technology. It's kind of important to understand really what it is because this is the nature of why we're so successful in cleaning. Uh, it is essentially an engine, as I described. They're mixing gas and air, combining it, and then detonating it inside of a combustion tube. So we are creating detonations, but they're in a highly engineered combustion tube. Typically, for thrust, they were doing you know, 40, 50, 60 detonations a second. For cleaning, we we use um, only two detonations per second. We're looking for the shock wave, but we're looking for a little bit more fuel and a higher intensity. Uh, we're not we don't care about the thrust. We want the the energy. So essentially, we're doing this as we're not storing the energy. So the gas in the air mix and it's ignited immediately, and it transitions to detonation in the tube. And because it's designed that way we can cycle this very rapidly. The differentiation between a, a pressure wave from a, 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 a air cannon or a, a sound wave and what you get with a, a detonation are quite different. The, the cleaning mechanism with a shock wave is, is much more robust and encompassing uh, sound waves are reflective and they are encompassing, but they are short lived. Uh, what you get with a, uh, a shock wave is a, a highly compressed front because once the detonation occurs, now you're moving at Mach 5, at least in our situation when we exit the, the combustion tube. So you've pre compressed all the air in front of it, and now you've created this rare fraction or this low pressure behind it, and that high low swing or displacement is what does the cleaning and then because we've created this vacuum because we pre pressurized all the air you get a trailing eddy current and this video helps to visualize that the initial shock is the dark wave and the, all the reflected dark lines are also cleaning energy but then this eddy current that follows behind it is why we're not just cleaning the front of the tube but as we sweep by we're we're actually cleaning the back side of the tubes also. Keep in mind that this is a an actual video of one detonation, one impulse. We do this a multitude of times. We've been very successful since 2006 when it was introduced by GE to the market, cleaning a multitude of uh, applications, primarily coal-fired boilers, but also waste energy boilers, wood fired boilers, a lot of industrial heat recovery applications, and we have been installed on a few HERSIGs uh, on the sidewalls in the past. Uh, typically, they get installed on the side of the boiler and they're just cycled proactively every 30 minutes, and we've got systems that have been running for the last 15 years, no damage or erosion to the tubes, they've been highly effective. So this technology has already been proven what we did is then take it and adapt it to an offline uh, cleaning system and automate that. We refer to it as, as EPIC or Extraction Pressure Impulse Cleaner. So comparing it to what else's other approaches on the market, uh, obviously dry ice blasting has been the way that uh, many of these HERSICs have been cleaned in the past. Uh, they, they could be effective in the first several uh, two rows, but it's very difficult for the dry ice without line of sight to, to get to the 
deposits deep within to to uh, to clean deep inside the tube bundle. They also require scaffolding or you suspending somebody in a uh, on a sky climber to get to the access to the, the areas that you need clean. Uh, there is no such pre staging or, or scaffolding required in our process. Uh, the if you want to get deeper into the tube bundles, it may require some tube spreading just to, to get that reach. So uh, that is the typical approach until another approach had came to the market, which is more of an open air uh, blasting methodology. It use, utilizes repeated insertion of, of bags of gas. They suspend them in uh, the, the into the area between the two bundles, and the, they detonate them into the open air. They're extremely uh, omnidirectional, right? So they're extremely dispersed. They, they're without focus or concentration. They go in every direction. It's a singular event, right? They, they inflate the bag and they detonate it. They then, in many cases, will insert multiple bags uh, in the same location to improve or enhance the cleaning effect. So the first one will fracture and it's very energetic. You know, they're using shock waves just like we are, right? The shock wave is very effective at dislodging the material. But this, this, they're singular in nature, so they have to repeat it multiple times uh, to get to enhance that effect. Our approach is unique because of the way that we're uh, introducing that shock wave. Uh, first off, we've we've created a directional shroud and we've mounted the uh, the combustion tubes on the back end of those directional shrouds. Um, everything is automated, so it moves left and right. And, and is lifted up and down, so we're able to navigate the uh, the HERSA completely. Uh, everything is modular; it all it all snaps together. Even the hoods are in two pieces, so everything goes in through the manway and is constructed in the lane. This is what the rig actually looks like. There's our combustion tubes, and so you get this overlapping uh, of the two combustion tubes and a 10 foot cleaning path. There, each uh, hood is five foot wide. So overall, we end up with a controlled and directed cleaning, repeated, uh, uh, rapidly repeated focused shock waves that we're directing into the tube bundle. Uh, it's all remotely controlled, uh, it's fully automated, and it's safely contained. So we're we're putting the shock wave exactly where we want it. We, we're monitoring the the, uh, uh, the back pressure, the pressure reflected back to the the cleaning hood because as we dislodge deposits we're going to see a trend as you know as we knock out more deposits there's going to be more pressure making its way through the two bundle and less reflected back uh, to the uh, the pressure transducer this is a not a quantitative number this is not to show that you know what what that flow potential is for your hersig it's to show what what work we're doing when as we're cycling how much of the material we're moving and and if we need to linger there and, and increase our amount of detonations, which all can be done on the fly just by touching the screen. So again, the, the rig is assembled in place, lifted to the top, and then we move from left to right and, and down very methodically covering every square inch of the, the face of the tube bundle. So we're, uh, uh, Cycling 120 detonations is pretty typical for us, not three or four or five, 120 detonations. And that's really the key differentiator for us. It's that two impulses per second, 120 or more times from each side of the panel. So we're not just cleaning one face. We're, we're, we go into the lane. We're going to clean both faces in that lane. So every face, again, assuming we're, we're contracted to clean every face, which we would highly recommend because the amount of time, since it's such an automated process, if we come to site, the majority of the cost is going to be the mobilization. If we're there, we might as well clean the entire HERSIG where you're going to get the best results that way. Um, it's that cycle or that 120 repetitions, that shock wave that fractures and then displaces and then ultimately polishes clean the tubes and again, we're starting from the top and we're working our way methodically to the bottom. So we're dislodging those deposits. We may linger at where the tube ties are. So we make sure that we may run a couple cycles there to, to you know, so things don't get hung up on those tube ties or those surfaces to try to make sure we're driving all the material down to the, to the ground where we can vacuum that out. 
And that really is, is, is our secret sauce is that high level of repetition and our ability uh, to clean and focus to every square inch of the tube bundle surface. A lot of this is again, all remotely done. All, I mean, all of it is all remotely done. So we'll go into the lane, we'll set up the, the rig, we'll lift it up, but then everybody exits the, uh, the HERSIG and it's lifted up and then it's all done via the control panel. You know, there's cameras on board, there's no personnel in harm's way. Uh, we can change or uh, increase the intensity uh, from the control panel. All this can be viewed by uh, personnel at the plant via uh, an external 50 inch screen, monitoring screen. So you have access to walk up to see exactly what's happening uh, during the whole process. So overall, we're using a very highly engineered 15 year proven cleaning solution. It's fully automated and, and remotely controlled, providing a high, the highest level of safety. Anytime anybody goes into that HERSIG, all of the, the flammable gas that's uh, utilized is, is purged from the line and the controller is locked and tagged out. So there's no electrical potential and there is no, flam and there is no flammable gas. It is completely safe for entry before we go in. So getting to what I'm sure the meat of the uh, presentation needs to be about is the case history. So you say you can do it, so what have you done? So here are some of our case histories. In the early stages, you know, can, can you actually clean like, we, like you say you can clean? So a customer asked us to come in uh, and uh, provide a cleaning. Uh, this was a NIM unit. Uh, they, they, this is not our video. They decided they wanted to go in and take a before and after boroscope to determine just how much cleaning we were able to accomplish. In this case, uh, we were uh, cleaning this side of the panel that was the box number four. So uh, there were three uh, modules past the SCR. We were cleaning the middle one and pushing and facing downstream towards the stack. So this area right here. Um, and in, in this case, again, we would normally clean both sides, but we did all the cleaning just from the one side since this was just a, a test. So here's here's the the before borescope that the customer took. First couple of rows weren't so bad. This had been uh, cleaned with dry ice in the past, uh, but as they pat, uh, pushed into the fourth, fifth, sixth row is where you start to see uh, a much higher uh, level of, of impacted deposits that were built up between the fins. So then after, in the same exact location, uh, customer win, and this is the after, and this is 22 tubes, 22 tubes deep, this particular module. Uh, and as he, as he pushes in now to that same five or six rows from this side, this is the result. So we were able to completely dislodge those deposits. Uh, should be noted that he went on to the opposite side and uh, did the same thing, and this is the this is what it looked like on the opposing side also. Vince, uh, this is Carl. Uh, a question just came in: that Can we clean uh, if there's a vertical gas pass <clears throat> that would uh, prevent us from going one side to the other? And the reason I interject that uh, question here is because that's exactly was the in, the, the case here with this unit. Is that uh, what we did? Is we did it per half, if you will. Uh, so we just set it up on one side, and then uh, dismantled the carriage, and everything, and just swapped it over to the the other side. And that usually takes approximately one hour to to change it over. But then we just go through the exact same process, uh, top to bottom. But we just do it uh, per half, if you will. Yeah. The the advantage to the design is it's a very modular. Uh, Set up so 
uh, obviously every Herzig is not the same width, so we'll set up based on the width of the module. If the modules are over uh, 25 feet, or is it? I think it's 25 feet. Then we'll it's over 30. Yeah. 30 feet. We'll do it in and set up in two separate lanes. So we'll set up and clean half, and then clean the other half. Uh, we'll just move it down, reset it up, lift it, you know, and then and do the process again. Yeah, we've done 32 feet uh, with one span, but uh, just depends on all the logistics. And Vince, I might interject: Is it back on the the slide that you had where you showed the uh, the unit up on the uh, uh, up in the air? Uh, was that the one that has the video uh, on it where you can actually run that form? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is this was the the first generation design, which is single hood. Uh, and, and so, but uh, this is the actual video of, of it. So, yeah, and then we would just, this hood would retract, we'd move over, push it back forward again and, and clean again. We're always pushing the hood right up against the, the face. So that we're we're directing those shock waves directly into the depth of the tube bundle. So the other case, second case history, in, in this case, Excel is, was kind enough to allow us to to use their name. This location was the Riverside plant. I believe Scott Wombach, who who, who did this uh, report, is is uh, on this presentation, not you know, in the audience today. So if you have questions for him or he wants to interject, feel free to do so. Uh, in this case, uh, they were looking to do a cleaning, they were evaluating several different approaches. Uh, ultimately, they, we were informed that they went uh, with the epic cleaning because the, the depth of two bundles, uh, they, they were wanting to make sure they were getting as much of those deposits out as deep in because this wasn't excessively dirty, their motivation in this case was that they were uh, uh, planning to come up and, and run for six years without an outage. So they wanted to make sure while they had an opportunity to go in there and, and clean it as good, well as possible uh, um, so they could make that extended run. Um, so overall, this is from their his uh, report. It was very, they felt it was very successful that we accomplished effective deep cleaning and that there was a, a very safe work environment, which was music to our ears, because that's what we strive for. Um, this is the actual uh, results. The two HERSIGs were cleaned at this facility uh, over four days. So basically four days to clean both, completely clean both HERSIGs. Um, the, again, the primary economic driver was uh, not necessarily the current CT back pressure, but their plan for an extended run followed the cleaning. Uh, the operating back pressure for both units was reduced to 12.4 inches at base load. This was reported by them to be within one inch of original design uh, based on an uncorrected basis, I think is what they, the qualifier there. Um, I don't know if Scott wants to make comment or if anybody has questions regarding that. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. Am I, am I live? I don't know if I can unmute myself. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Yeah, it, it's it's everything uh, uh, that Vince and Carl are saying. Um, and like I said, we looked at a few technologies. One thing I'm not sure you mentioned, you know, one of the big drivers to us looking beyond, we've done ice blasting and air blasting in the past uh, with some success. At Riverside, the modules are very deep where, you know, some other, you know, sometimes you may have 10 or 12 or 14 rows of tubes uninterrupted before you have a cleaning lane. And so, you know, if you want to spread tubes and things from both sides, you can get into the middle at Riverside. Our our last two modules, the coldest two modules with the most falling, one is 20 rows deep and the other is 24 rows deep. So that that makes it really challenging to clean with what I'd say traditional technology. So, yeah, then we started looking at, at uh, kind of detonation or pressure wave cleaning technologies. We knew Vince from... Uh, a different a coal unit, our Sherco plant, where he's got some equipment installed. That's been real successful there. And we started talking about this and, and we, yeah. So we looked at those options. We thought this this was probably the one for us and uh, and ultimately ended up working with them. And, and it went really well. It's it's everything he says. Um, 
we haven't, you know, we didn't do, uh, we shut down the plant in January and we didn't restart until June. It was a very long outage. So, you know, doing exact before and after, you have to correct for the ambient conditions and the exhaust flow. I did a real rough correction, but it's not, that's why I said it was un uncorrected. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't as good as it could be, but, you know, it was so good. It was obvious that it, it did it, everything we wanted it to do. And so, you know, I was like, well, do I sink a bunch more time in getting an exact number? No, I got other things to do. So, uh, like I said. Perfect. Thank you. So I think just mention a safety front and it, yeah, hopefully they're, they're okay with me talking about this. So, you know, it's a complex system. They're, they're putting in, you know, flammable gas, highly flammable. And there was a, uh, you know, you go through safety prior to the project uh, beginning uh, as you always do, right? And you have a safety plan, but everybody knows, you know, things happen. And so hopefully your plan covers those situations. Well, uh, and I think he mentioned it briefly that when they're, when personnel are entering the HRC, they purge all the fuel lines with inert gas and they've got, you know, bottles and racks all hooked up to do that automatically. Well, during one of our cleanings, they actually had a, a small flex hose on the rig, it, you know, I, I don't know if it was just leaking or if it broke exactly, but anyway, it, 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 uh, it, you got some flame outside and there's cameras on the rig. So you're watching the cleaning in real time. And th those monitors they have on their, on the outside of their cargo container is pretty cool because then tourists, you know, can, can be watching without getting in their way. Anyway, you could see the flame um, on the monitors and they immediately, I mean, within seconds, you know, they're like, hey, we could see the flame. They hit the button, purges all the lines, puts out any fire, you know, and then we monitored for CO and other things before we entered the space. But, you know, it, it things don't always go as planned. It didn't go as planned and their their safety plan basically went exactly as it should. And, and, uh, and that was reassuring for us, you know, that uh, anyway, so. I'm kind of rambling on, but it, it did go very well. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I would I would say that, that that is one of the things we pride ourselves on, that, you know, and because we are dealing with flammable gas, there are a lot of safeties built in uh, to the system. Uh, and, and um, you know, within seconds, we had abated that issue. And uh, going forward, we've also made a design change. We were using uh, now, hard tubing instead of the flexos so we don't see uh, won't see that kind of failure in the in the future any questions on that before we move on to the the next case history case study okay all right the third case history is from a combined cycle plant in south carolina uh, in this case we cleaned all the modules downstream of the scr on two uh, Hersigs. Uh, this was quite a dirty uh, Hersig. We removed about 18 tons of material out of each of the two Hersigs, 17 and 18 tons. A total of six, 36 tons were, was removed from both Hersigs. Um, this data was uh, provided by uh, the customer to um, our friends at Neuter Erickson, this was a Neuter Erickson unit, and they were kind enough to actually analyze the numbers so we could quantify the effect of our cleaning. Uh, so these numbers are actually provided uh, by Glenn at, uh, at Neuter Erickson. Thank you very much for your diligence there, Glenn. I think he's also on, on the line uh, or attending the, the presentation. Uh, but the unit one uh, had a 64 BTU per kilowatt hour rate heat rate improvement, which equated to about a 1.33 megawatt increase in performance. Uh, unit two had very similar uh, 73 uh, B, uh, BTU per kilowatt hour heat rate improvement and a 1.2 megawatt increase in uh, performance. And uh, so the plant had advised us that their normal annual runtime on these is about 7,800 hours. If you average, you know, both units running in with an increase of an average of 1.2 megawatts for the 7,800 hours, you generate about another 19,500 19, megawatt hours per year, uh, utilizing a cost of $32 per megawatt. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, I know that it's different. So in, in different locations, so you can kind of plug in your number. I'm told it can be much higher than that. Uh, but at 32 megawatts, uh, $32 per megawatt, that would bring an additional revenue in the first year, $624,000, well exceeding the cost of the cleaning. Uh, 
to another combined cycle plant in uh, Arizona. We did four large persigs there. These are even larger than the, the ones in uh, South Carolina. Uh, we were able to clean all four of these in, in a nine day span in March. Uh, the cleaning scope for the, this particular units, they, they only wanted the, originally they were just looking for us to clean the last two uh, modules. We convinced them that while we were in that lane anyway, to go ahead and flip around and clean that, that fifth uh, face. So we actually ended up cleaning five of the eight total faces uh, in that bursig. The results for that plant uh, were even more dramatic because it was a larger unit, but uh, uh, 159 BTU per kilowatt hour heat rate improvement, uh, about a 1.74 megawatt improvement in, uh, perform in uh, performance. Um, and then uh, on unit two, uh, 120 uh, and a 1.78 uh, increase in megawatts. Uh, I think there was some anomaly here that, that they were talking about as far as the, the readings on the pressure before and after, but that were, they were attributed that to a faulty sensor because they were absolutely to capture, capture the improvement here on the uh, heat rate. So, um, again, noting that we only cleaned five of the eight available faces to us. Uh, we achieved a an improvement that would have equated again at thirty two dollars per megawatt hour of eight hundred seventy five thousand in in the first year. That was uh, a pretty dramatic improvement. Uh, Duke Energy is the fourth uh, case history, fifth case history here, and uh, in this case, uh, Duke is, is also kind enough to allow us to utilize their name. Uh, it was the Osprey Energy Center in, in Central Florida. Uh, one Hersig was cleaned in this case, a four day period to clean the one Hersig. I, I note the four days is because this was early on spring in 2020 when we, we had our original rig with single hood design. So uh, with, with the double hood, we, we move at a much faster pace. We clean a much larger area each, each cycle. So uh, four days to clean the one Hersig there. Uh, and they were very happy with the results. In this case, um, the, the customer shared that, that their improvement was uh, uh, four inches of water column. And uh, they regained four inches in, in their, uh, re reduced their back pressure by four inches. And it resulted in the heat rate uh, of, of half a million BTUs per megawatt hour. They computed this to be essentially a 41 day payback for the, the what they paid to have the cleaning within 41 days they recovered that money so uh, they were very happy and they have, you know they actually had us come back out again this year and clean the, another hersig uh, the, the companion hersig to this are there any questions about those case histories i, I i'm going to go into a little uh, just kind of a final recap or overview of the the entire process this is a, it's a animation that kind of steps through A to Z of pretty much encapsulating what I said, but uh, what I've shared so far is probably a lot more continuity than what I provided, but uh, are there questions to that or should I I'll, I'll go right to that overview? Just go to the overview, Vince, and then we'll deal with all the questions. Okay. The Epic technology provides the highest level of safety for personnel and equipment by significantly reducing confined space entry and eliminating scaffolding. The accumulation of fouling deposits on HERSIG's fin tubes can compromise plant performance with increased CT back pressure, restricting generation, and increased fuel costs. It is crucial to the HERSIG's efficiency that your offline cleaning solution utilizes the most thorough and effective technology available. Incorporating more than a decade of proven technology from PowerPlus cleaning systems and Thompson's field experienced automation crews, the Epic cleaning system efficiently cleans fouled HERSIG tubes using remotely controlled, fully automated, and selfly contained detonations created within a high pressure combustion tube to directionally focus highly effective, rapidly repeated shock waves into and throughout the heat transfer modules. Traditional methods, like dry ice blasting, require scaffolding, considerable exposure to confined space conditions, and may entail mechanically spreading the high-pressure tubes with limited depth cleaning capabilities. The EPIC offline cleaning system, powered by the PowerPlus Impulse system, 
is a safe, proven, patented technology that is designed for efficient on-site assembly via standard manway access points and requires no scaffolding. Engineered for remote-controlled precision, the EPIC cleaning system maneuvers around obstructions to reach all accessible surfaces of your HERSIG tube modules from both sides of each. The EPIC system produces a rapid series of controlled combustion events generated solely within our own highly engineered combustion tube that permeates deep into each tube module with 120 or more repetitive focus shockwave impulses at each and every cleaning shroud position. This is repeated on the opposite side for a cumulative total of 240 reverberating impulses. The rapid shockwave impulses progressively dislodge and effectively purge deposits from tightly spaced fin surfaces at each cleaning position without spreading tubes. The loosened deposits are further motivated to the lower header area with the assistance of lower intensity vibrators. The proprietary EPIC cleaning process is automated and remotely controlled, covering every square inch of the tube wall surface and innermost depth yielding industry-leading cleaning results. The EPIC cleaning directional shroud is maneuvered in three-directional axis. The EPIC cleaning system is uniquely engineered to allow full control of the detonations with both visual feedback observation and real-time back pressure measurements observed from a command center monitor that allows for adjustable targeting of the shockwave's intensity and repetitions. Real-time monitoring not only gives Thompson operators full control of the EPIC cleaning system to ensure maximum deposit removal and coverage, but HERSIG owners can also view the live cleaning process from a 50-inch monitor. The EPIC cleaning procedure harmonizes Thompson's industry-leading automation and daily deposit removal vacuuming service, utilizing our own skilled personnel with unmatched attention to safety. Clients also receive actual pre- and post-process borescope video inspections ensuring a complete cleaning that minimizes downtime. The EPIC system is the most effective and efficient method to deep clean fouled fin tubes and decrease combustion turbine back pressure, restoring your HERSIG to its optimum operation with targeted approximately 120 or more reverberating impulses at each and every cleaning position from both sides of the modules. No mechanical integrity damage to any HERSIG component. No tube stretching or spreading. Automation requires no scaffolding and minimizes confined space entry. Reduced fugitive particulates during cleaning and startup. Lower decibel level versus open blasting. Reduced outage duration with all cleaning performed by a single source. Highly competitive cleaning costs and delivers the safest service on the market. Are there questions we can address? I, I presume there are some questions. I saw them yeah. fly by, so I'd like to address those now. Um, yeah. So, so Vince, we have uh, we have quite a number of questions. We have we have actually two sets. There's been uh, some on the chat, and uh, and then there was some that were sent in beforehand. So, I tried to link these uh, in the uh, chat together so so that we can uh, so that we can cover. The, the, so the first one. If uh, Yogesh Patel uh, he, he's with us, and he could he could just ask his uh, he has two questions. Yogesh, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first of all, very good presentation and uh, very detailed, and appreciate uh, sharing the information. Um, basically, um, what kind of uh, improvement do we expect? Is like four inches or five inches or so. And associated to that is, um, do we need to do boroscope inspection, particularly in HPU operator or so? And the reason why is um, the under deposit corrosion, you know, some of the, you know, scale buildup that occurs in the form of very thin, you know, kind of sheet and because of this shock waves, you know, it would become loose and plug up the lower header. Yeah, so the first part of the question is how much improvement do you think that we can accomplish from a cleaning? It's, a, it's nearly an impossible number to, to quantify. Uh, I can tell you past experience can be 
you know, between three to five inches of improvement, but that really depends on the, well, multiple factors. And I'm going to presume that you're going to allow us to clean all of the modules because not in every case, that's not, uh, they may only give us the last two modules that they consider the most uh, the most impacted, well, there's still some deposits in those, there may be less, but uh, they're causing some back pressure in the system in the first couple modules. So, uh, presuming that we clean all the modules, uh, the, uh, the improvement can be uh, uh, quite dramatic. In this case, uh, you mentioned uh, there's some agglomerate, agglomeration that, yeah, that is some a mitigating factor also. We have done very friable deposits. Uh, you may have noticed that the uh, the borescope video earlier that didn't show a lot of agglomeration. That was just a lot of rust or scale. That's easy to remove, very friable. But we've also gone in and, and cleaned uh, highly agglomerated deposits that have, there's been a lot of uh, um, ABS that has bound up with the uh, 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 iron oxide uh, to create a pretty tenacious deposit. The advantage to our approach is the, the high amount of cycling. So that that allows us to initially break up those hardened or calcified type of deposits. But as we continue to cycle that, you know, 20, 30, 40 detonations, 50, 60, 70 detonations, up to 120, we're fracturing, then displacing, and then driving out, and then ultimately polishing clean as best possible. And if we need more, uh, it, it's not unusual that we've done a, a much higher number of detonations based on the back pressure or just observation from the camera that we need still to do some work. So we'll we'll hang in place and we'll cycle more uh, to accomplish the best possible result. Uh, does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, Vin, uh, Vince, I think Yogis was uh, asking about uh, about deposits on the inside surfaces. He mentioned under deposit corrosion. Oh, and so this is so this is a very uh, common question that we get all the time, and it's in the pre the pre questions. It's so there's a very is there's a right. very big dip. There's a very big difference between looking at conventional flat plants and HRSGs in the back end because they're loose deposits on the internal surfaces. And it sounds as if Yogesh has a particular problem with under deposit corrosion, where there's a lot of deposit on the inside. So I think that was the focus of his question. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I have had that question before. When we have not had any issues with exfoliation or you know just basically dislodging material on the ID of the tube, the shock wave itself. Uh, you know, again, we're. The majority of the pressure is contained in the combustion tube. The resulting shock wave at exits is is creating a, a swing in, in uh, pressure high low in the air column or gas column outside of the tubes. When it hits the solid surface, it's the, it's not going to uh, create that shock, recreate that shock wave. It's not going to transport inside or through that hard surface. It's going to reflect or or encompass around the outside of the tube. So you don't get that kind of displacement energy to the ID of the tube that would cause that uh, removal of a deposit on the inside of the tube. And we have not had, uh, we have, we've had any issues with that. Oh, okay, thanks. There's a, now there's a couple of questions from Matthew uh, Hal Halverson. If we can, uh, if we can, Scott can just activate his. Uh, he had some questions about uh, gas baffles and uh, minimum widths and stuff. Uh, Matthew, are you there? Yep, I'm here. I actually had those answered in the chat. Uh, oh, we okay. Have, well, uh, 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 could you sh could you share them though? Because everybody mightn't have seen that. Absolutely. We have two units that were coming off for a major in the spring, and we're looking at doing some back-end cleaning, but they have vertical gas baffles that essentially break our uh, sections off into to four, they're probably right around five feet wide lanes. Um, and I was just curious on if those would still be available to use this technology if we were to add the appropriate uh, cable ports in the ceiling and the roof. Matthew, this is Carl. I'm, I tried to insert that in there. I'm not sure if it got into the chat session, but uh, we can do uh, with, you know a four foot uh, span. 
it's just we just have to have a little bit of notice so we can uh, adapt our hood for that. But uh, our equipment's all modular, so we can go from three to increments to uh, six to 12, whatever. Uh, but the, the hood and so on can definitely be used in a, in a shorter span and, and do the, uh, the vertical baffles. We've done those before as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, Matthew, is that all? Is that all the comments you had? Yep, that was everything for me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Though there were some, um, there were some comments from uh, Ivan. I I don't have his la I don't have the last name, but uh, yeah. Uh, hi, this is Ivan Hour with the General General Um. So yeah, they answered all my questions in the chat, but I'm happy to share them. Uh, except for I did, one question wasn't answered, isn't it, Blake? So similar questions to Matthew in terms of, but mine were specific to port locations, um, where those sky climber ports would be located. Um, just give a little background um, on our site at Portland General Electric. We have uh, seven FAs, two Hersigs there. Um, we also have five hundred one Gs with Neuter Erickson um, Hersigs, um, air cooled and steam cooled versions of those and um i also have uh which is kind of unique is uh a ge i have six ge hersigs horizontal hersigs um vertical flow uh, on the gas side so uh that's a whole nother whole nother uh problem but um might be a separate conversation that i have with these guys uh, on another time uh, in terms of my questions uh they answered about the port locations, um, I noticed that our our Hersigs do not have uh, sky climber ports. We scaffold currently. We use grip blasting and ice blasting um, primarily. So uh, we would have to install uh, ports. And uh, Jeremy Knight provided some answers on that. It looked like it was four to seven inches from the face and eight to twelve inches from the sidewalls, but uh, they're flexible on those dimensions. Yeah. Um, my two questions are. That were not answered. Can you speak to ammonium bisulfate cleaning on your system? Have you had experience with that? Um, that's mainly what we're cleaning in, at our sites. And then um, also in the video, it mentioned lower intensity vibrators, and I don't, I didn't pick that up in the discussion uh, prior to the video. So I wondered if you could talk to what that, what that was referring to, and why what those are needed for. Well, we. Uh, first of all, the ABS, yes, we, we clean multiple units that have had issues with ABS. Um, you're not the only ones that have that challenge. But, uh, yes, we can, we can break up those deposits. Uh, again, and, and that's really the answer I gave when I was thought that that's what he was talking about before when, he was when Yogesh was talking about the you know, exfoliation on the inside. Uh, I was making comment to uh, deposits on the outside that were maybe calcified or hardened because of the uh, the ABS binding up the the iron oxide. And yes, we can successfully clean that. Regarding the the vibrators, we dislodge a tremendous amount of material that you know, and we methodically work it from the top down to the bottom. But when you get to the bottom, the the headers are you know kind of a choke point. And we really want to get them from those uh, out between those headers to the to the ground, uh, you know. And so those vibrators were, are an attempt to to keep that material flowing through the little bottleneck at the bottom and, and get it down so we can get it vacuumed out. And, and and Carl can speak to that maybe a little bit. But you know the the crews, the vacuuming crews will go in there still and try to air lance out what is a couple feet above the those air headers, or not air headers, above those 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 headers that um, tend to uh, bridge with the material because we're dislodging such a, a large amount, if that makes sense. If I may interject, Ivan, is it uh, on the lower headers is that in order to get access to the, uh, the lower uh, headers and so on to remove all that debris is that one of the, the few things that we ask the client to, to do is to, is to remove the lower row of sneak baffles give us good access and of course replace them afterwards and uh, then open up the, the sky climber ports. Uh, and then Barry, if I can revert back to that topic we were talking about, about the 
uh, exfoliation problem, the idea of the tube, which we do not cause, but uh, occasionally it bring, it's brought up, can the tubes be left full of water or empty? And it virtually makes us no difference whatsoever. You can do either, uh, you'll have the same results. Good, thank you, Carl. Uh, Scott uh, Wombecky had a, had, a, had a comment on dehumidification in relation to the ammonium bisulfate. Scott, do you want to just verbalize that? Sure, we, you know, not specifically because of this cleaning, but when we did that clean, when I was talking before, I think I mentioned it was an extremely long, it was a steam turbine major, so it was months long. And so as a preservation tactic, we were dehumidifying the HRCs, both on the water side and the gas side. And so uh, ammonia salts, you know, people are question, and there's different ammonia salts kind of in how, how much they are. And if you're in a humid climate, um, you know, they're, they'll grab atmospheric moisture and get moist and they'll swell up. They might be more adherent. One thing that I think helped us, although I, you know, I'm speculating that it helped us is that, um, you know, we were dehumidifying beforehand. So everything was nice and dry and crumbly and, and friable. Um, again, we were doing that for preservation, not for the cleaning. It probably helped clean a little bit, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident we would have gotten gotten the stuff off anyway, but that was one factor. That definitely made our job easier. But yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah. I will say I, I did put one other thing in the chat. You know, somebody had talked about having acoustic oh. baffles yeah. or shipping braces that obstruct the rig going up and down or make you disassemble and reassemble it more times. Um, you know, I, I just look at we were looking at um, you know scaffolding up and removing some of that stuff in some cases. You know, you don't need that stuff and you could remove it permanently. And, you know, it's a one time cost that when then accommodate if you think this cleaning is is best for you, if you've got really deep two modules or for whatever reason. But anyway, so we're with our success we had earlier this year, we're looking at doing that at some of our other plants. So, you know. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, Vince, there's uh, there's two more quick questions before we uh, before we go to Bob and, and look at the questions that came in before. One was from um, uh, Scott uh, Henry, and, he, and and I'll just read the question. Do most HRSGs have installed connection points? Uh, we, I presume he means uh, installed uh, sky climber ports. Is that what he means by connection points? I presume so, but he can he, he can ask if he if he's still here. Scott Henry. In if it's in relation to the sky climb reports, our experience has been that many uh, of the uh, Hersigs already have those. There's been a few cases where we've had, they had to be put in. It's not that difficult of a process. And we're not, we don't need that many uh, ports, uh, but uh, typically they, they are existing and, uh, and we can be somewhat versatile. We're just trying to, because we have the ability to push the rig forward uh, again, to move around obstructions, uh, we, we were able to kind of move in a three-dimensional axis. But uh, Eric, we've only we've only incurred one unit so far. It was an Alstom unit that did not have any sky uh, climber ports or cable access access ports whatsoever. That was the only one that we've incurred. But in none of the Hersings we've cleaned have any ports had to be installed. Uh, but uh, you know we do look closely at that and, and give us specifications when we give the uh, proposal. Good, thank you. Uh, the last question from the chat is from uh, Shri uh, Ramulo, and he just asks, uh, I think, a, a, a simple, straightforward question: How many days required for cleaning one HRSG operating on seven FA05? Carl, do you want to address that? It's, it's was that uh, what was the fire? The old part I didn't catch the one word of fired on, on seven FA combustion turbine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be covered in in what you're going to be reviewing when Bob uh, introduces those questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, you can answer so it now, just, and we'll skip it then. Yeah. yeah let's okay. let's hand over to Bob. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to take. Uh, for a single Hersig between two and four days, three is probably the, the norm. 
Uh, but uh, for a unit of that size, just depends on configuration and so on. I think you said it was the Neuter Erickson. I believe this is the one. Uh, but uh, you know, those are very, very open. They have no restrictions whatsoever and very accessible for cleaning. But you know, it, just, it depends on the condition, how many faces they want to do and so on. But as Vince mentioned before, we do encourage a client to consider doing the, all the faces instead of just the, the, the ones on back in on the cold end. But does that answer the question, Barry? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, yes, you answered. Um, the question is, there's three days, uh, including installing the sky climber and uh, you know, everything set up is possible within three days? It takes us about a half of a day on the front end to set up and a half a day on the back end to set up. Oh, okay. to tear down, yeah, at the end. But as far as being, uh, you know, in your way, if you will, that's uh, it's physically inside the Hersey. The, the other time frame I gave you is realistic. Oh, okay. Hey, I would like to, to Scott Wombeck again. I would chime in that, you know, in addition to that, things like thermal wells and thermal couples that are sticking through the walls of the HRC in those lanes, you got to remove those. So, you know, we had a, probably a day and a half of work uh, with the JLG and a little bit of scaffold doing some of the prep work. That was before Thompson arrived, but just. Yep. Okay. Doing your overall planning. Don't forget about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, cool. uh, Bob. I think it's over right. to you. Okay. We've got a number of questions and uh, one minute to go, but we'll, we'll take whatever time we need to get through them. Uh, some have already been answered. Uh, the first one is uh, asking about collateral damage to things like SCR, CO catalyst, uh, penetration seals, expansion joints, and so forth. So, could you comment on the on your experience with those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, we've got. I mean, apart from the, uh, the our experience with the mobile system, we've got a a long. Uh, history 15 years now of cleaning uh, large and small boilers. In some cases, we're on package boilers where we've, they've cut a hole through the sidewall and we're an inch away from the the, the, the tube surface, cycling our our, our shock waves 24/7. You know, every 30 minutes, without causing damage. So uh, the you know the the big difference in our approach is that unlike open air detonations our combustion happens inside of our the highly engineered combustion tube so the resulting shock wave is uh that's projected into the tube module is uh you know it's it's working in the air column as i had early earlier kind of described is that shock wave is working on the air column around the the high low pressure the displacement to dislodge the deposits but it's not exacting an immense amount of PSI or pressure on the actual structure itself, the surfaces, things like SCR or, or CO catalyst seals, they, they see very minimal if, uh, uh, pressure that it, or cycling and we've caused zero damage and are not able to cause this type of damage that I hear. I know it's a concern because you hear detonations, but again, we have a highly engineered combustion tube. That energetic event happens inside of the tube engineered to take that cycling, a Schedule 80 pipe that'll take 8,000 psi of pressure. So, no, the answer. The, too late for the short answer, but no, we we can't okay. cause those that kind of damage. All right. Then there's several several other questions around uh, noise level. One is. Uh, uh, do you do it? Do you work within certain hours to avoid disturbing surrounding residents? Uh, and how far away can the can the blast be heard? Yeah, and then reiterating uh, my previous point that the detonation actually occurs inside of our combustion tube, and then the it's it, it there's a directional shroud that is placed right up against the face of the tubes so what the the, the actual sound pressure or the that's as we exit the face is is directed right into the the densely populated tube bundle 
And so it consumes and dra drastically reduces the, sound, the, the external noise levels. So we've actually measured noise levels uh, at the open door during a cleaning. And this is at the worst case where the, the rig is down towards the ground close to the door at about 195 to 105 dB at the actual door opening. And as you move 20 feet away, uh, it's much lower than that. And then uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 dB. Typical again, sound attenuates differently in different applications, but uh, you know, and as you move to the property line of the facility, it's much lower than that. So it it pretty much doesn't exceed the normal sounds of the you know of of the plant operating in its day to day. So we we really don't have a restriction on when we uh, when we would run. You know, Bob, we don't, uh, in all the ones we've done, we've never had a client ever had to to notify the neighbors or uh, you know, the local authorities or anything like that because the uh, the noise level is is low enough that it's uh, it's basically just part of their operation. And uh, some people have uh, kind of classified the noise from a as a uh, long distance rifle shot. Uh, what they heard in that one brief video in there, of course, that was. Further up, but uh, you know it, the, the noise level has not been an issue in any place. Now we did do a job that was right next to a cemetery. That out of courtesy we did uh, stop the cleaning uh, during that time. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, we, while, while there was a service going on, yeah, yeah, while there was a service going on. <laughs> oh, you weren't and, uh, you weren't worried about waking the dead. You just <laughs> didn't want to interfere with the service. Yeah, no, exactly. We try to be respectful. Is there, it's okay. good. Uh, Scott, if you're still on here, did you actually take uh, decibel readings yourself on the on the job for you? I think it has reported at, uh, about 90. You're still there, Scott? Yeah, yeah sorry. My, uh, the, no, oh, the right. audio is cut a little in and out. I did. Yep, we hit a sound meter. We took it just outside the doors. Yeah, when the rig is way up high in the HRC, it wasn't very loud at all. You know, it was in the upper 70s, I think. But when the rig was down close to the floor, which is, of course, right where the door is, I was getting pretty consistently between 83 and 85 decibels. And I mean, I'm standing like five feet outside the door. I did maybe I got a couple of peaks in the 87, 88. But yeah, it uh, it wasn't louder than a lot of other stuff that's going on in a power plant. So, uh, yeah, that wasn't really problematic for us. Thanks, Scott. All right. Well, thanks. Um, all right, let's see. The next question is, uh, uh, I think this was mentioned in your video, but it says, what do, what do the emissions look like, stack emissions look like when, when you start up initially after cleaning? And of course that varies, <laughs> uh, very difficult to quantify. And let's presume that they have allowed us to clean all of the, the modules, hopefully, uh, but the advantage uh, to our approach is because we have such a high cycling rate uh, and repetition that continually drives material out, we tend to, you know, go from just lodging the material to polishing the tube uh, to a great extent. So anything that is loose should have been knocked loose to the ground and vacuumed out. And, and I think in, even in the video at the end, uh, there was an actual commentary from the, from the, uh, Plant, we removed 36 tons of material. They commented that on startup, there was just a brief wisp of uh, particles that they saw uh, very short lived at, at startup. So, uh, it, 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 I think it's one of our advantages is that we are able to um, remove a, a large amount of material and leave very little for the opacity when you start up. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I'll chime in on that too, if I can. It, yeah, our Riverside, that was a big concern of mine. Our Riverside plant is right in Minneapolis. Uh, and so a lot of visibility. And if you, you know, throw rust flakes on your neighbor, you're going to hear about it. Um, it. And we've had some particular emissions that had happened at previous cleaning. And, and this one was really good. It was, like I said, it was a very small visible plume for just a few minutes when we restarted we did move some rust flakes to the stack area but they all stayed on the floor and we just vacuumed them out the, the next opportunity so that was yeah that was actually better than i expected all right great uh, next question simple 
can people work in the uh, HSG while you're cleaning? Simple answer, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, can when, people work in the gas turbine while you're cleaning? Yeah, downstream at the gas turbine. Yeah, I think, or upstream, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah, I would say that would be okay. Uh, the concern that we have inside the Hersig is not just the sound pressure levels, which you know you can abate why, you know, with proper uh, hearing protection, but we're introducing a flammable gas, and for safety reasons and protecting our our pristine safety record, no, we won't. We, it, and there's overhead, you know, there's you know there's uh, rigs overhead. We the answer is no. We will, you know uh, we do not allow other work inside of the Hersig, the actual Hersig, while we're doing our cleaning. Okay. Um, we did, uh, uh, just because I love to talk, uh, <laughs> I, uh, we were doing gas turbine work at the time we looked at that. We considered scaffolding up at the round combustion turbine discharge to, to tarp that off. Uh, ultimately, didn't have to, but yeah, we were measuring noise and, and, and things up there during the beginning of the cleaning. And we also temporarily stopped. We were replacing about 40 HRG penetration seals at the start, and we initially stopped and got those guys off the scaffold because we weren't sure if the pressure would, you know, be forcing air out of the, you know, the floor when you've disassembled the seals. Uh, after testing some stuff around there, that also became a non-issue when we went back to work, you know, right. all on the outside of the HRG, but in conjunction with the cleaning. So, of the uh, also one of the things that enhances the the minimal uh, exit from the stack is the twofold. One is that we're cleaning from both sides, and I don't want to be redundant on that, but it, it is crucially important because uh, even though we typically can clean from one side, we do both, but that secondary uh, cleaning on the other side further enhances and motivates the, the particulates to get to grade. And then second is, is that uh, at the, for the vacuuming operation, uh, typically what we do is that the we will have the vacuuming operation on night shift. Uh, and uh, so we do it throughout the cleaning as opposed to uh, all at the end. So there's a lot less material to keep moving around inside of the Hersey. Uh, what we did with Scott, because it was such a long distance and they had their own uh, personnel, their own vacuum trucks and their own personnel. They did the cleaning and uh, we just worked with them in conjunction and. And I think it only took them, them a couple nights to, to do all the, the vacuuming and everything. But those things kind of help complement it to when you keep on top of that vacuuming and not just let it all dissipate to, to the bottom and then try to get it all out at the end. You try to keep keep on top of it. It adds a little bit of expense to it, but it's it has great dividends for the guys moving around in there and moving all the equipment. And, of course, the sneak baffles. And we've got air lances we've made up. and special uh, nozzles to be able to get up underneath the, the headers and to motivate it. So all that stuff compound that kind of helps keep that down. And then the vibrators, when we do to use them, uh, that helps as well. Okay, Scott, if you're still on, you may be able to give an answer to this one uh, as well. It's two questions. One is, uh, how often do you need to clean an HRSG? And uh, what, what uh, are the best indications to tell? When you need to clean, you know, visual inspection, pressure drop, back pressure. Um, sure. Uh, um, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's different for everybody, uh, and it's it's highly dependent, especially if you have ammonia salts on your fuel quality. You know, your natural gas. There's the Pacific Northwest, for example, traditionally has way more sulfur in their fuel than uh, than other parts of the country, like Minnesota. We're we're pretty lucky. Um, so in Minnesota, we're doing about a six year interval on our cleaning, but the visual inspections are good, but the back pressure is really the the ticket, right? So if you started out, like say 15 inches back pressure as a brand new equipment, and you've gotten up to 19 or 20 or something after a bunch of years of operation, you know, it's time to clean. You're looking at, you know, run backs on your machines in cold ambience and, and things like that. Um, uh, so that's what we're doing. We're doing visuals and then just constantly looking at that. And the good news is nothing happens really fast. So generally the increase in back pressure is, it's fairly consistent, right? So, you know, if you're gaining an inch a year or a half an inch a year or something, you can kind of project that out and, and be a couple of years ahead to make sure you got, you know, money in the budget and talking to people that are going to clean for you and planning and whatnot. So. Uh, was there another question? Sorry, you stacked them up, and I might have missed something. Yeah, I stacked them up. 
pretty much. Uh, Vince, you got yeah. anything to add to that, or is that good? No, I mean, other than I would say that uh, looking at the paybacks, you know, you, if you're regaining, you know, a, a, a enough uh, that you're increasing your megawatt output by one to, you know, one and a half, uh, there's a payback right there that's inherent that, you know, the, the cost of the cleaning is, is quickly realized or recovered uh, in the improved performance. So, uh, but it, as Scott says, it's kind of different for each utility, you know, what numbers you're, you know, what, what your, your key issues are. Yeah. All right. Um, there's several other questions here, but I'm, I'm going to say that they've all been either answered in the presentation or addressed from other questions. There's one final one that, that isn't, um, <laughs> it's, can it also be used on coal fired boilers? Oh, that's setting me up. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking, <laughs> Uh, that's where it was. The, the system was designed to clean large coal-fired boilers, uh, and we have long-time experience since 2006 doing so. Uh, and Scott even alluded to the fact that it's one of our bigger installations. The second largest in, uh, is is the XL uh, coal-fired boiler at, at uh, uh, Becker Station up in uh, uh, Minnesota, and they've got a 900 megawatt coal-fired boiler with. Uh, 18 of our, you know, impulse cleaners on the side of, you know, from top to bottom on the side of the boiler cleaning their, their coal fired boiler. Yeah, now that, that's a, uh, an online system or online and offline. No online, which we clean proactively. So, as opposed to a soot blower that might run every 4 or 6 hours or, 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 or once, once a shift. We would uh, we would run every 30 minutes to an hour on a product because we're not relative to the tube circles. So we just cycle uh, on a, either set up on internal timer or it can be run from the plant DCS based on the load. But all of that's capable in the system and it, yeah, it's an online system. We don't go in offline and uh, and use that to clean. We 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 maintain maintain cleanliness. Yeah. All right. Oh, good. Excuse me, Bob. Can I make two quick comments? Uh, sure. I was mentioned about a uh, a horizontal Percy, and uh, we've been taking a uh, look at those on the uh, on the convection sections inside of the refineries and so on. In fact, uh, uh, Jeremy Knight's on this call with us, and he was on the crawl through one here recently up in uh, Illinois. So we've got a an approach to clean those from the top side and or the side. And stuff, so we'd welcome that. And then, uh, also from the, the frequency standpoint, you know, our goal with the, with Epic is to be able to ultimately be economical enough that people can consider cleaning before it gets to the point where it gets to be uh, acute or absolutely necessary. And maybe they maybe within getting the maybe they can pick up six or eight inches or something like that, or maybe you only need to pick up two or three inches to have a, a payback for the cleaning. So, you know, that's a goal that uh, we have with clients that will be able to get to that point and be economic well, that, enough that they can consider doing it earlier. Well, that, that can be important, especially with deep bundles. If you, if you let it go until it starts bridging over, it becomes uh, much more difficult to, to remove it, uh, no matter what method uh, you're using. Okay. Well, we're, we're about, uh, 16 minutes beyond quitting time, but I think the uh, discussion and questions have been good as well as the information. I see one question in the chat here. I think I'll answer it. It says, is the two phase cleaning done from both sides of the module simultaneously? And the answer is no, you do one side, move over to the other side, right? Correct. All right. Well, um, so that people can, uh, see participants dropping off rapidly as well. So people have other things to do as do others. So let me call us to adjourn and thank uh, Vince and Carl for your presentation and thank all of you who participated in, in, in this. And uh, we'll see hopefully most of you uh, next month on the 21st for the normal open HRSG forum session. Thanks for the Thanks, time. everyone. Thank you so sincerely for, for hosting us. Thank you. Bye.